Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. Can I just uh, get the brothers at the back to settle down? Jazakumullah khair. Okay, so I want to welcome everyone to our panel and seminar here today. Alhamdulillah, um, we have an all-star lineup out here. And uh, I just want to give a short introduction to all our mashayikh. And first of all, we have uh, Mufti Shujath. Honestly, I don't know where to begin here. Um, we're also blessed and honored to have him among our panelists. The immense amount of knowledge he brings and then the, just the pure blessing of having him in this community is amazing. Next up, we have uh, Maulana Osama. For those of you who are in Siri, I don't think I need to introduce him anymore. I think that's, good, that's enough. However, for those of you not going to the Siri Jami Masjid, uh, Maulana Osama, if you guys see all these events happening for the youth, mashallah, he's one of the people who started these initiations, and inshallah, they will keep going. So um, if anyone is around Sari Jami, I imagine make sure to pass by and see the events setting up there. Next, we have Imam Yama. Imam Yama has been an amazing part of the MSA for, think about two or three years now, and I don't know what we would have done without him. Mashallah, his, again, the knowledge and then the pure feeling of having someone like Imam Yama on the team is more than enough to kind of like push everyone to be at these, to understand, to really get in touch with the religion, with the deen, with Islam. And finally, SFU MSA treasure and alumni, Ahmed Khan. So if all of you are here, um, three, four years ago, Ahmed Khan was the previous president and now, mashallah, he's studying at Zaytuna College with Sheikh Hamza Yusuf. So definitely it's an amazing addition to this panel. And today's topic, inshallah, will be the pillars of faith. And with that, without further ado, inshallah, we'll get started. Jazakumullah khair. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah rabbil alameen. Wa sallallahu wa sallam wa barak ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Allahumma la ilma lana illa ma'alamtana inna kanta al-alimu al-hakim. Wa la hawla wa la quwata illa billahi al-ali al-azim. Alhamdulillah, as we go into this talk, we are talking about the pillars of Islam, the pillars of faith, and we've had workshops before for those of you who have attended. This stems from a famous tradition of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that is famously referred to the Hadith of Jibreel. The Hadith of Sayyidina Jibreel Alayhi Salam is one of the foundational a Hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that the angel, the archangel Gabriel himself comes in order to ask the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam questions in order for him to demonstrate and to teach the religion to those around him in order for him to get the honor of sitting in the presence of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and taking knowledge from him and also confirming him in his knowledge Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. This is one of the rare cases where the teacher is not more superior than the student. As the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, is the best of all of God's creation, including that of the angels. As it mentions in the Jawhara of Imam uh, Ibrahim al laqani <clears throat> The Prophet Muhammad وسلم, was asked, what is Iman? What is faith? This hadith in particular, I really love it because when we present Islam to our non-Muslim neighbors, friends, colleagues, um, old high school friends, whoever you know, this hadith really gives you a beautiful, uh, concise uh, description of the different dimensions of Islam, the inward, the outward, and also the spiritual, and a fourth component about the signs of the end of time. My topic here is to speak about Allah, to speak about God Almighty as the first of those things that the Prophet ﷺ, when he was asked about what is Iman, he says, Al-Imanu an tu'mina billah. 
that iman is to believe in Allah wa malaikatihi and his angels. Belief in Allah, the Prophet Muhammad once gave advice. He says, Qul amantu billah thumma staqim. I was blessed to be with a teacher of mine that pulled the masjid together after they were leaving. And then he said that I'm going to explain this hadith. He went on for two hours on that hadith alone. What it means to say, Qul amantu billah, that we believe in Allah. Muslims, Many of you being Muslim, and perhaps maybe some of those watching or those who of you who may not be Muslim, the idea that Muslims have and the concept that Muslims have of God is truly unique. Because the Quran itself is this incredible book that was brought by an unlettered prophet, peace and blessings be upon him, that clearly throughout the entire Quran gives us descriptions about God, tells us who God is, His essence. Allahu la ilaha illa huwa al-hayyul qayyum. Allah, there is no God save Him, the living, the self-sustaining or self-subsisting. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala throughout the whole Quran for the Muslims explains who He is. But often everything that He tells us is always with a touch of transcendency. This is because Allah Tabaraka wa Ta'ala, as the scholars say, put it best, Kullu ma khatara fi balika, wallahu bi khilafu dhalik. Bi khilafu dhalik. Everything that comes to your mind about what God is, God is other than that. And Sayyidina Abu Bakr as Siddiq, one of the companions of the Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, radiyallahu an, he said, Al ajzu an idrakihi idrak that the inability, the incapacity to truly understand God, knowing that a human being is unable to truly comprehend God, is correct comprehension. So, nonetheless, we know that there is a creator. And this creator, whatever led us to the belief of the creator in Islam, this has to be recognized by the individual. There's no such thing as blind following in the faith. We do not blind follow in the faith. Taqlid fil kalima la yajuz. As for fiqh, it's wajib, because nobody's a mushtahid mutlaq, okay? But as for that which relates to belief, every individual must be themselves convinced that God exists, He's real, and that that conviction has led them to faith. That is done through reflection, that is done through direct experience, that is done through different uh, experiencers or different, different methodology that the ulama highlights, some through reflection, some through deduction, looking at the cosmos, looking at creation, reflecting on the inner human being, some reflect on the science through the scientific signs of the heavens and the earth, through their incredible design and the makeup of the human being, etc., etc., etc. There's different ways how we deduce that. Some it may be as simple as, no way do I believe all this just came out of nothing. It's impossible. Now we work, work more towards the idea of, if there is a creator, then who is that creator? What describes that creator? And we as Muslims, we do not say anything about Allah except what we know of Allah informing us. We do not have any knowledge of Allah except that which He's told us. So in the Quran, we have many, many ayat of the Qur'an, many verses of the Qur'an that tell us of the essence of God and it also tells us about the attributes of God. And the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam clearly told us what those attributes are, either Allah Himself revealing that in the Qur'an or through the hadith of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And what we get is this incredible picture <clears throat> of a creator that is not in need of time, not in need of space, has always existed, there is no beginning, there is no end, there is no similarity to creation. God is not a man, God is not sitting up in heaven, He doesn't have a son, He doesn't have a wife, He doesn't have children, because these are the things that we as human beings have, and Allah is other than, uh, He is utterly dissimilar to His creation. So this is the picture that we get. And then we know that this God knows everything, He hears everything, He sees everything, He wills everything, He has knowledge of everything. 
and he has command over everything. Not only that, but that same God tells us in the Quran that not only has he created us, but he is constantly creating us. He is the one that created you and what you are doing. So not only does he know that the, the leaf falls, it's not just by his permission, it's by his will. It's by his creating. It's by his making that moment to appear and exist, maintain and sustain and annihilate all at the same time. Because what is existence? Since the time our brother introduced this panel, he moved out, that moment is gone. It's non-existent now. It doesn't exist. It's in the past. But we witness with our eyes is God's power. God's creating, God's willing. All of those things Allah just did, we witnessed it, but now we see it as gone. The moment doesn't exist anymore for us because we're finite creatures and everything we often do, we think of in finite terms. But Allah is not like that. And yet this man, 1400 years ago, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, has given the world an introduction and a presentation of the understanding of God that in my opinion is the most incredible presentation ever because it's so pristine and so perfect. And Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala, He creates everything and his names, among his names are al Hay al Qayyum. Al, I wanted to use al muhyi wal Mumit, the one who gives life, the one who takes life. al awwalu wal Akhiru, the first and the last. al Zahiru wal Batinu, the apparent, the apparent in that his attributes are all around us, in that we witness Allah being the provider, the guide the forgiving, the subtle, the caring, the compassionate, because we're witnessing creation, show that manifestation of that. We ourselves daily are experiencing God in our life. We have a new day every day. We have the exact same things we experienced yesterday, we're experiencing today. The problem with the human being, it gets used to patterns. So you eat yesterday, you ate today. You eat tomorrow, you get used to pattern. I go to work, I make money, I eat. That's a pattern. The pattern doesn't do anything. It's Allah who uses the pattern. And when he wants to change it or alter it or do whatever he wants, that's in his dominion and it occurs daily. This is why some people don't have a job, they get a job. Some people don't have a, they have a job, they lose a job. Some people are alive and they die. Some people are coming in. Every hour, something like 500 people are being born every hour. And something like 500 people are going out every hour or perhaps every minute. The statistics are incredible. Every moment Allah is involved in creation, His attributes, they're manifesting before us. This idea and this concept makes God, makes God very real in our life and experienced in our life. Right? So we, the Muslim sees everything being from God. And they attribute every beauty to God. Because God is beautiful and He loves beauty. All of that comes from Allah. And when we make ourselves beautiful or handsome or look nice, we do it for Allah. Because in Allah Jameel, Allah is Jameel, Yuhibbu Jamal. He loves beauty and everything. And Muslims had beauty in architecture. Muslims had beauty in what we used to write, how we used to script things. Everything about us was supposed to be beautiful. Allah has written Ihsan upon everything. Even what it concerns to animals, spouses, all of our relationships. So we could say a lot, but definitely Allah is the one, the unique, the ever existent, Everything depends on him. He doesn't depend on anything. He was not begotten. He, did, he was not given birth to, nor did anything emerge from him. And nothing can compare unto Allah. One of my favorite verses in the entire Quran is, لَيْسَ كَمِثْلِهِ شَيْءٍ وَهُوَ السَّمِيعَ الْبَصِيرِ Allah began it with negation. Just like we do when we say, لَا إِلَهَ There is no God. This starts with negation. First seeing that there is Nothing that is worthy of true worship, illallah. Laysa kemithlihi shay. There's absolutely nothing like the likeness of Allah. Yet, He is all seeing and all hearing. 
And this is what the Muslims believe, that Allah is the only creator. If Allah is the only creator, there cannot be another creator. If he's the guide, there is no other guide. If all power is with him, there is no other power. But then we see what we do in creation, and that is because they are the means. And part of his wisdom is he created a world of means. Everything we achieve, we have to achieve through means, but then God has the power to give through means or without means. And he does that. And he demonstrates that throughout history. So that is the belief that we have of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now it is similar to what Jews and Christians may believe some things about God, but they're different in many other ways. We do not believe in the Trinity. So how can we as Muslims say we pray to the same God that others say the, the, the Holy Ghost is in there and the Son is there and the Father and they're one? This is not the same. Our, our understanding of Allah has differed a lot. Yet they're called Ahlul Kitab in the book. This is a whole other matter because they, were, they had prophets and messengers and books that were revealed to them. I'll leave it to the other speakers to expand on that. But we believe that this same God sent Moses, Jesus, Adam, all of the different prophets. And he is the same God that we all worship or claim to worship, but our understandings vary. And so... And then we also believe in angels. Just really quick, two minutes on the angels. They're neither male nor female. They're angelic beings that are present with us uh, in this room. And the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu said something so beautiful that I think best illustrates the life of the angels. That, they're <clears throat> that the heavens and the earth, the entire creation is about to rent asunder, it's cracking because not a hand span and the heavens and the earth remain, except that there's an angel prostrating or worshiping Allah in it. So when you look at the 200 billion galaxies that they estimate exist, that's only the first level of the heavens. They haven't even seen the second, third. They're filled with angels that no one knows their number except Allah. La ya'lamu junood rabbi illa hu. No one knows the number of the angels, but we know among them, the greatest of them being Sayyidina Jibreel alayhi salam. He's the leader of them. Mikail, Israfil, Israel, Ridwan, Malik, Munkar, wa Nakir, and many other, Hamalat al-Arsh, and on and on and on. There are many angels with core responsibilities. And they are some names that are biblical as well. We call them by the Arabized names, but they're also similar in the Bible to Gabriel and Michael, etc. And some of the Qiraat of the Quran is also read as Jibra'il and Jibreel. So there's different ways of reading it that are considered correctly. And uh, Mikail being like Michael. So we believe in the angels. The job of the angels vary. They're not seen by our eyes, but they're present. And they also, some of them, they make dua for the believers. The Hamalat al-Arsh make dua for the believers. There's angels that record our deeds. Does Allah need that recording? Of course not. That recording is for yourself on the day of judgment. So when it's shown to you, you won't complain or you won't object. Everything will be done to justice. And uh, so belief in God and angels. I'll stop here because uh, I'm a bit sick. My throat will uh, tighten up. And I've said enough. Barakallahu feekum. Wa sallallahu ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sallam. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah rabbil alameen. Adad khalqihi wa rida nafsihi wa zinat arshihi wa midad kalimati. Wa salatu wa salamu ala ashrafil anbiya'i wal mursaleen. Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahabatihi ajma'in amma ba'd. So my topic for today, which was given to me by my elders here, is our belief uh, in the prophets and the holy books of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So to understand uh, our belief about prophets and why it is necessary, it was necessary for prophets to be sent in this world, we need to take a look at the conversation that Allah had with the angels when Adam alayhi salam was created. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said to the angels, وَإِذْ قَالَ رَبُّكَ لِلْمَلَائِكَةِ إِنِّي جَاعِلٌ فِي الْأَرْضِ خَلِيفَةً That look, I want to make a successive authority, a khalifa of mine, in the world. Now the angels like, were completely in a shock. They're like, Ya Allah, why? And their reasoning was that, oh Allah, we have been created for the sole purpose of worshiping you. 
can't sin, we don't have the ability to sin. This is why humans are ashraful makhluqat, the best of creations. Because angels don't have the ability to sin. They have been created with the purpose of worshiping Allah. But insan, us, mankind, we have been given the ability to sin and to do good. And we have been given this ability by Allah to sin and then to repent, which makes us much better than the angels. You know, sometimes, you know, growing up here, you know, I see some of the guys that come to me, you know, like, Shaykh, you don't know about me, I'm really bad. Like, no, you're not bad. No, Shaykh, you know, I'm really bad. God hates me, Allah hates me. No, no one is bad. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says through the words of Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that you know, if you guys are so perfect that you don't sin, then Allah will wipe you away from the face of this earth and bring such a creation that will sin and then will repent. So anyway, the angel said this to Allah. And Allah said to the angels that, look, you don't know what I know. So just you know, leave it to me. So Adam alayhi salatu was salam, according to our belief, was the first human that was created by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created mankind, there was a need of guidance. Allah didn't create us and just leave us alone or abandon us, running from post to pillar, looking for guidance. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave us methods of guidance. And one of the first methods were prophets. So Adam alayhi salatu was salam, was the first prophet of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We believe as Muslims, uh, it's an Arabic term, that prophethood is not kasabi, it's wahhabi. Meaning that you don't go to a course to become a prophet. You know, there was no degree that, okay, I'm doing a Nabi degree. You know, there was no, okay, he put in so many hours, okay, this guy is gonna be a prophet. No, it was wahhabi. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chose people. Like Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa he was chosen by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's why if you read the seerah of Rasul alayhi salatu wa salam, since childhood, there was something different about him. Anything he would do, it would be completely different than, than other people. So prophets are chosen by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we believe that every action that a prophet does, everything that comes out of the mouth of the prophet is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That is why our aqidah, our belief is that prophets do not commit sins. They don't make any mistakes because they have been chosen by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent Prophet Adam alayhi salatu wa salam and then many prophets after Adam alayhi salatu was salam. One thing we need to understand here is that whenever a new prophet came, they did not cancel out the other prophet. Like, you know, they didn't come and they're like, okay, listen up y'all. You know, it's me, my way or the highway. You know, the prophet that came before me canceled out. No, none of that. What the reason he came and, and any new prophet that would come, he would confirm what the previous prophet brought to this world. That is why so many things that were permissible in the nations before us are impermissible now. For example, we cannot do sujood to anyone, prostration. But in the nations before us, sujood of ta'zim, sajda ta'zim, prostration of respect was allowed. Why is it forbidden in our religion? Because there is no Nabi after Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Back in the days, for example, let's say the nation of Ibrahim Alaihissalam, they would do sujood of ta'zim the prostration of respect. But once their prophet would die, and as time would pass, they would slowly start worshiping other people. Then the next prophet would come and be like, hold on, this is wrong. But because there is no Nabi after Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Allah closed all the doors that could lead towards this religion being corrupted. That shows how Islam is protected by Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. And there are many other things, for example, the whole argument about picture is being permissible or not, that's the whole idea behind it. So every prophet that came confirmed what the prophet before them brought. And our Nabi Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was the final and last messenger of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. He came in the last, but he was the leader of all the other prophets. Now, what was the job of the prophets? Very simple, Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala mentions that in the Quran. He says, لَقَدْ مَنَّ اللَّهُ عَلَى الْمُؤْمِنِينَ The way Allah describes prophets is so beautiful. He didn't say, 
we sent prophets. He said that we did a favor upon people. What did we do? Is ba'athafihim rasula min anfusihim. That we chose people amongst them, from them, and made them prophets. So there was no angel that came and said, okay, I'm a prophet. There were people from them that were made prophets by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What was their job? Yatlu alayhim ayati. The first job was that you will recite the verses of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is our belief of prophets, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks to prophets. It's either through an angel, through the dream. Dream, it's only a revelation when it is shown to a prophet. I remember when I used to study in Pakistan, there was once a headline in the newspaper that a man slaughtered his son because Allah told him to slaughter his son. But we can't do that, you know, your dream is not hujja, okay? You see a bunch of dreams, right? You know, we watch a bunch of things before we go to sleep and then we, you know, it's, it's not like that, okay? So the dreams of Anbiya were Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaking to the prophets. Sometimes Allah would speak to them directly, sometimes through an angel. So Allah says, their first job is, Yatlu alayhim ayati. Whatever Allah tells them, they tell the people. Number one. Wa yuzakkihim. Second job is they do taskiya. Taskiya means they cleanse the hearts and the spirituality of people. That the aqaid are wrong, the beliefs are wrong, the practices are wrong. For example, when the Muslims migrated to uh, Habasha and they were standing in front of the king, Nijashi, and the king asked Jafar, Jafar, what does Muhammad teach you? What does your Nabi teach you? And the speech he gave was so emotional. He said, yeah, O King, we had no idea on how to live our lives. You know, and if you read some of the books of Sirah, especially uh, there's this book, we study Al-Nurul Yaqeen. In the beginning of that, the way the author describes the life before Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, you can't sleep at night. It's like, for example, one example I'd give you, is they were addicted to gambling to the extent where they would gamble and they would bet their wealth and they would lose their wealth. They would bet everything they had and in the end, they would bet their wives and they would lose that. You know, this is such a life they were living. So Jafar ibn Abi Talib said that we had no idea on how to live our lives. But then Allah sent this light and he sent such a light that we thought, you know, we're living in a darkness, darkness we're never going to come out of. And this Nabi taught us, he did taskiyah. What is taskiyah? That believe in one Allah. You know, don't commit zina. Respect your wives. Respect your mothers. Treat children with love. So taskiyah, you know, cleansing the hearts. And وَيُعَلِّمُهُمُ الْكِتَابَ وَالْحِكْمَةِ That he teaches them the book and wisdom. You know, Rasulullah that's what he taught the ummah, wisdom. You know, a young man once comes to Rasul alayhi salatu wasalam, and he says, O Prophet of Allah, allow me to fornicate. You know, allow me to do zina. Trust me if someone comes to me right now and says, Shaykh, allow me to you know, commit zina. I'm like, oh, you know, you kafir, what are you talking about? You know? But Rasul sallam, this man comes to him, Ya Rasul Allah, allow me to do zina. What did the Prophet say? How would you feel if someone spoke about your mother like this? About your sister, about your aunt? I wouldn't like it. Yeah, exactly how you won't like this, people don't like it either. And the Prophet took his right hand and he struck his chest. He said, ya, Ras- ya Allah, please clean his heart. Do taskiyah of his heart. Wisdom that, you know, how are you suppo- supposed to speak to people? How are you supposed to invite people to Islam? Or if someone is struggling with deen, what are you supposed to do? Or the story of the Shaykh, you know, the story of Jari bin Abdullah radiallahu an. Such taskiyah was done, Jari bin Abdullah from the royal family, you know, and his horse, it's in Riyadh al-Salihin, this lengthy narration, his horse dies, rahmatullahi alayhi. And now he tells his servant, I need a new horse. So this guy goes to the market and he sees a horse, beautiful. You know, and you know, if you're Pakistani, you know how our mothers fight when they go to the market. I mean, Pakistan Sheikh, you know, one day we went, and the guy's like 8,000, and my mom's like 400. I'm like, I'm out. Okay, so, you know, the people like to, you know, bargain. So he bargained, and he managed to get that horse for 300 dirhams, and he brought it to Jarir bin Abdullah. And Jarir bin Abdullah looked at the horse, and he said, how about I give you 500 for this? Everyone is in a shock. Like, 
you know, you're the buyer, you're supposed to bargain. What are you doing? Then he's like, okay, how about 600? And then Jadid bin Abdullah, according to one narration, gave 800 for that horse. The deal was finalized for 300. So the servant asked him that, why? Like, why did you do this? Such a nice deal. This is what Taskiya is. This is what the prophets would do. This is hikmah, this is wisdom. Jadid bin Abdullah said that this horse wasn't for 300. It was for 800. This man didn't know, very simple guy. But I sat in Masjid al-Nabawi, and I gave my hand in the hand of Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And I promised Rasulullah that never in my life am I gonna cheat. Am I ever gonna be dishonest? Am I ever gonna lie? If I had bought that horse for 300, how would I face Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam on the Day of Judgment? Taskiyah, Prophet, wisdom, how you teach people, right? So this was the job uh, of the prophets. Now, one way of guidance, that was given to these prophets were the books that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed on these prophets. So there are four uh, major books, Torah, uh, Zabur, Injil, and Quran. See, these are the major books. And then we have the scrolls, the, the scriptures that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave uh, some prophets. So these books were a means of guidance for that nation. For example, Torah was revealed upon Musa alayhi salam. So it was for the people of Musa alayhi salam. But the miracle of Rasul sallallahu alayhi wasallam is that because he was the final prophet and he was given the final book of the Quran. So this Quran has been protected by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And all the books before Rasul sallallahu alayhi wasallam were books which were only for that nation. But this book is guidance till Yawm al-Qiyamah. So this is how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent prophets for the guidance of mankind, and then sent books to help the prophets guide mankind. Now, before I give the mic to the sheikh, is we are looking for solutions elsewhere. We need to come to the Quran. Once we're in the Quran, once you're connected to the Quran, we will find the solutions to all our problems. One story before I end, I have so many stories. You know, Sari Jamai Masjid, all you have is stories. So, you know, this couple came to me, a young couple, right, Sheikh? They're like, the girl is like to me, Sheikh, please issue a divorce. I'm like, okay, I'm like, you're young, man, don't. Like, what are you doing? Then issue a divorce. The sister tells me, I've spoken to 300 people, and all 300 have told me I should divorce. So I'm like, where did you find 300 people that listened to your problem and they told you to divorce? She told me, read it. <laughs> read it, and then she showed me read it. Oh, Queen, you deserve better, you gotta get out, you pack your bags, head out, it, that kind of thing, right? So instead of like going on the internet, looking for answers, all of that, come to the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and connect yourself to the book of Allah. One of our teachers, Sheikh Taqi Uthmani, may Allah preserve him, he would say mm -hmm. that reciting Quran after Salatul Fajr and understanding the Quran is the solution to all your problems. Make a habit. You know, take a translation, tafsir, sit after Fajr, recite for even 15 minutes, that's enough. With the translation, understanding it, you watch how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will change your life. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala enable us to act upon what has been said. Ahmad Khan? What are you doing this What's the end? Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen wa sallallahu ala seyyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa man tabi'ahum bi ihsan wa da'a bi da'watihim ila yamiddin ba'd. Allahumma iftah alina hikmatak wa anshir alina rahmatak ya adal jalali wal ikram. La hawla wa la quwwata illa billahi al-alihi al-azim. La hawla wa la quwwata illa billahi al-alihi al-azim. وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا. الحمد لله. We heard from my co-panelist 
Sheikh Yama Hafidullah and Sheikh Musama Hafidullah very eloquently touching upon the foundations of faith. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, God the Creator, the Almighty, the messengers, the books, and also the angels. One of the interesting things about Islam is that it wants the followers essentially and everyone else who attempt to understand the faith to solidify the foundation. And therefore, what Shaykh Yama Hafizahullah Ta'ala stated as an, opening, as an opening remark, bringing to light the foundational hadith of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Hadith Jibreel, one point that is very personally appealing to me, what he also alluded to, but is this. Jibreel Alayhi Salatu Wasallam, who regularly brought revelation to Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam throughout from the beginning to the end. The only time that he vis visits this earth now is only on the night of Qadr. No more he visits the earth because the, the job is over. And therefore, I mean, it's a topic of its own, but I don't want to get into it, but that's the only time that he visits the earth. But during the time of Rasulullah Sallallahu so the first time when he came to Prophet Ali Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the scholars of Hadith, they state, as a teacher to Prophet Sallallahu basically not a teacher as a teacher as we understand, but to pass on the message of Quran to him, and also to teach the method of Salah. But this Hadith, Hadith Jibreel, is very unique in this regard. The scholars, they say, the very way, the very way he sat in the presence of our Nabi alayhi salatu wasalam, it is to mark that all the previous experiences that he had between him and Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam were different than this one because now the way he approached Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is the approach of absolute humility and tawadu. He came as the, the humble student, the way where he sat, the way he approached Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So this shows this whole journey how it was in terms of seeking knowledge and gaining knowledge. Now, in the very same hadith, he also highlighted and explained the foundational tenets of faith, the articles of faith. What I am left to speak about, the, one of them is of course Qadr, the other one is the belief on the Day of Judgment. And I'm quite sure both of these tenets, Shaykh Yama Hafizahullah would do a much better job than I would but somehow I've been given an assigned to speak about and I will try to summarize it because both of these tenets of faith require a lot of explanations and a lot of time to go into the depth of it. And it is this that brings to mind a lot of questions, especially to our youth and youngsters and people of you know, uh, liberal and secular and rational mindset. But inshallah, let's hope and pray that what I'm able to summarize, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us to understand it better. Uh, so one of the articles of faith and tenets of faith as Jibreel alayhi salatu was salam you know, stated in the hadith that Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam basically responded and tu'mina bil qadri khayrihi wa sharrihi min Allah. That you believe in qadr, all good and bad both, good and evil both from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, when we look at the Qur'an, the primary source for our understanding and deducing the understanding of our deen, so we find throughout the Qur'an many references to this. There are two particular terminologies that Qur'an itself uses that I want to bring to our attention, and what do they really mean, and then how, how do we understand Qadr? So the two terminologies, the words that Qur'an references to this concept of Qadr, of course, the first being Qadr, Qadr, and second being Qadr, Al-Qadr. Many people, perhaps, they only hear or they only know one, but both are related to this topic. Qadha and Qadr, both are used in the Qur'an. For example, in Surah Al-An'am, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, هُوَ الَّذِي خَلَقَكُمْ مِنْ طِينٍ ثُمَّ قَضَىٰ أَجَلًا 
And then there are many, many ayat that uses, in fact, more than 10 times about the word Qadr. So the, what does Qadr mean here? Generally, it is translated as ordainment. So what it means is that the pre-eternal knowledge of Allah, the perfect knowledge of Allah in which all the events of the world and also the actions of human being present. And they, before they actually reveal and occur on the face of the earth. All what, for example, you and I sitting here, it was predestined and also in the, in the pre-eternal knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on so and so date and such and such time, such and such place, people will gather. So this is what we call qada. And with respect to qadr, it is, so first is the, the, the pre-eternal knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, ilm al-azali, as the theologians use the term. And with respect to qadr, it's the literal meaning of the word qadr is to measure things out. You know, from this we have the word qadir, from this we have the word qudra, the power. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, one is that the knowledge, the pre-eternal knowledge that he had about each and everything of, uh, that is to take place in the universe before they actually unfold and take place. Second, this, this uh, qadr is to, to, to allow those events, those actions to take place in a time that he designates and decides as per his knowledge. This is what we call qadr, measuring out things, measuring things and events and the actions according to the certain time and according to the certain measures. So this is with respect to qada and qadr. Now how do we understand this concept of qada and qadr? To give you an example, you know, we are sitting in this beautiful auditorium, right? And not just the auditorium, even this entire ca campus. Before this campus came into existence, what was there before? The plan of an engineer, right? And the blueprint. This blueprint and the plan of the engineer basically described the very function, the nature, the purpose of the building. With, the, yeah, with each and every minute detail, for example, how many chairs are going to be arranged here to accommodate the audience, how many lights are going to be, each and every minute detail would be there. Am I right? So if that's, so this helps us understand as Allah, Sayyid Sulaiman Nadwi rahimahullah ta'ala uses this beautiful analogy, it says, the master of the masters, the genius of the genius, and the khaliq, our creator, had same thing as a blueprint for the entire world and the events of the world and the details of the world. Now, with this in mind, look at the hadith of Rasulullah Sallallahu and very sound narration in which Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi said, "Inna awwala ma khalaq Allah Subhanahu wa Taala al qalam." The very first thing that Allah created before creating anything else of this universe, it was the pen. Not this type of pen, but the divine, something that is, that is related to the divine as in nature. And then Allah commanded that pen, you might have heard this hadith, to uktub, to write. So the pen responded back, it spoke. It is, as it spoke, it responded and asked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, our creator, Ya Rabb, mada aktub, what should I write? Then it, is, it was this that said to the pen that uktub maqadira kulli shay'in ila yawm al-qiyamati. Write the destiny and the events and the actions of the, the, the world and the human beings all the way until the end of time, qiyamah. And it did so, and it was preserved in the Allah mahfuz, the major tablet. So this now relates to that ilm, that eternal knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the foreknowledge of Allah before the actual events unfolding on the face of the earth. Now, when we look at, for example, the, the meaning of this, that you know, all good and bad, as we heard, positive and negative, good and evil, everything takes place as per the knowledge of Allah, and it is by the will and the decree and then the ordainment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, wait a minute, what does it mean? It means that are we attributing evil and ill also to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Is it the case? Are we being forced 
to do things that are of, as seen as a matter of choice at times? How do we understand this? When we look at the books of Aqidah, for example, you know, this famous phrase that is quoted in many books of Aqidah, the creed, Kullu shayin yajri ala mashiyatillahi subhanahu wa ta'ala. Four things are mentioned. Ala mashiyatillahi wa ilmihi wa qadaihi wa qadrihi. Each and everything runs and takes place according as per the ilm of Allah, the pre-eternal knowledge that I have mentioned to you. Number two, by the will of Allah subhanahu wa according to the will of Allah, nothing happens as Shaykh Yama Hafizahullah has stated, you know, even a leaf from the tree does not fall, as Allah says in the Quran, you know, that wait, without the permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That is, you know, it is as simple as this example, as small as this one. And qada and qadr, as I referred, by the decree of Allah, by the ordainment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Both, all these four things are mentioned. So the question that often time comes, comes to mind, you know, with respect to how do we understand this? And as I, as I said, are we being forced to do things, etc. So what is very important for us to remember over here, generally people, their approach to understand this, you know, this is from very purely rational and secular perspective. And therefore, people are misled and get confused to understand. What is very important to note that, number one, this concept, what is the concept? As I have explained to you, that you know, good and bad, both being referred to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, first and foremost, you have to have some form and kind of religious basis to understand this. You cannot have completely a secular paradigm to understand this. And it has to have some kind of reasonable religious ground. And this is why Islam is not the first one to tackle this subject. Many religions before Islam, whether it's Christianity, Judaism, all, basically all religions, traditional religions and divine religions, they did speak about this. And of course they have gone to extremes in different ways. To give you one example, for example, we have in Christianity this doctrine of good and evil. Because Christianity paints the image of God as being all good, all great, all loving, all merciful. No doubt God is such, definitely. But on the other hand, it does not speak of the other qualities of God that we, and we have in Quran. We have this very fine-tuned balance. God has the qualities of beauty and he also has the qualities of majesty. So this is how we harmonize both aspects. So this is, because, number one, this, there has to be the, this foundation to understand and approach this topic. Why? If you do not have that, then you will have issues to understand because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, God the Almighty says in the Quran, for example, لا يسأل عما يفعل وهم يسألون. God is not questioned about his actions, what he does. But we will certainly will be questioned about what we do. So to understand this in more details, one more point that I want to add here, that the theologians, they have divided this topic into four levels to explain this. Number one, they said al-ilm, the pre-eternal knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Number two, al-kitaba, what I refer to, the, the preserved tablet. The knowledge of Allah, what he had about the events, all of that was preserved and documented in that preserved tablet. Next to that, it is this very important to understand many things. Why, as I said, there are questions to come to mind. You know, if God is the planner of all actions, and if he is behind the scene, then why are we being blamed for the wrong choices that we make or the wrong actions that we do? Is it fair? That's a question that oftentimes we get from, you know, from people, right? You know, why blame people and why punish people for the wrong deeds? Because if God is the one who planned this, if God the one who has did uh, behind the scene allowed this. So in order to understand this point, the scholars say that the third level after al-ilm wal kitaba the preservation of the pre-eternal knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala about the events of the world, is al-irada is al-irada, and in this irada is the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the will of our creator. It is subdivided into two. You know, al-irada tul 
versus al iradatu tashri'iyya al shar'iyya what does it mean al iradatu kawniya the universal will allah in his divine wisdom does allow certain things that we find you know a, a bit of a not comfortable for us for example suffering for example sickness for example other things so this is because of his divine wisdom he does allow things likewise disobedience that is his irada because we have to understand this world is not paradise it is a place of test right and in and also certain virtues to be able to manifest themselves and to be able to guide people to adopt for example if there is no suffering then how would we exercise sympathy for example and empathy and kindness so it is al irada al kawniya the universal will of allah allows that and there is a fine difference between the two versus you know this al irada al kawniya versus al irada al shar'iya the legislative will allah never ever commands never ever commands some some in, some kind of ill actions to be done one is to allow which is the because of the nature of the universe and the place that we live in but all the dictates of sharia which is the legis religious one only commands for things that are good the things that are beneficial things that are positive so this is how we look at and then these events unfolding in the world that's called we call khalq so all these four together al ilm wal kitabatu wal iradatu wal khalq putting together forms this concept of al qada wal qadr hopefully it's a bit clear for us now <clears throat> in the end of this discussion like i said it's a very lengthy topic and one of the most complex and difficult ones in in the entire science of theology in the entire science of theology imam imam hanifa rahimahullah ta'ala speaking on this point he said something beautiful i want to add this here he said like in katabahu bil wasfi la bil hukmi just to add on to this all this was described the events the actions of human being in the preserved time before the creation of the creation right as i said but how did allah describe that or how did allah command the pen to describe mention as a descript description of something not as a command and there is a big difference between the two for example if i if i say you know you must do this it's a command so the whatever you do the responsibility falls on me versus defining the moment the circumstances the choice of the person the free will that the person uses to do something allah creates the free will of person in the person but he uses that free will and he himself executes that action and this is why he says katabahu bil wasfi la bil hukmi so let zaid allah does not say let zaid be a disbeliever let zaid be a disobedient rather allah says Zaid will use his free will and will make his choice and desire fair therefore he will be a believer versus the other person he will desire corruption he will pursue the path of destruction hence he will be the people of hence he will be the among the people who will cause killing and bloodshed and the rest based on their own personal choice so this is was and hukm and and therefore and with that what applies is the universal law of cause and effect for example we all are sitting here right is there anyone who forced you to come here you chose to be here you chose to be here and therefore we are here so if we if we say if we really were to find something compulsive then we would be the, the the secular people would be the first one to say you know we are people who are being forced to do certain things and that is why it is important to understand the concept of free will and also the concept of choices that people make and also the law of cause and effect in the universe and therefore they will be responsible we will be responsible for any choice that we make and i end with this beautiful example that some of the scholars used to as a metaphor to explain this what is the example the example is about in any game in fact but they use this example of you know chess if we are familiar with this this game it has predetermined rules that dictate the movement that a player should make right there are rules that you need to use in order to play the game 
But within that predetermined rules, the player is free to make any movement so long as it remains within, the time, within that framework. You understand? There are predetermined rules to, that di dictate the moment, the movement that can be made about the game. But within that framework, the player is free to exercise his choice, and in this way, the predetermined rule and also the freedom of the player, both are preserved. Both are preserved, but the choice the player will make accordingly will be the consequence of the game, whether he will be a winner or loser. So this is one of the beautiful examples that we see in this regard. And in the end, Rasulullah has cautioned us and warned us to discuss this topic too much because this is beyond the realm of, hum realm of human being comprehension. Rasulullah said, for example, in one hadith, he said, إِذَا ذُكِرَ الْقَدْرِ فَمْسِكُ عَنْهُ When you see people discussing and, and you know, diving deeper into this discussion of qadr, stay away from them, stay away from the topic. And he even stated in another hadith that, you know, the previous religious communities deviated because of their heavy involvement in the discussion of Qadr. Because, we, as I said, Christianity and other religions, because of this over-obsessed explanation and discussion led to different types of deviation within that religious uh, tradition. And we also had, in the early days of Islam, during the formative years of theology, two extreme groups. There was one, you know, Al-Jabariya versus Qadariya, the fatalist versus those who, one completely denied Qadr. The other one said, you know, there is ultimate free will for human being. So that's why Wahab ibn Abba rahimahullah ta'ala said this great tabi'i, you know, I looked into the matter of Qadr and I was bewildered. And then I looked at it again, revisited the topic, trying to make more sense out of this. He said, then I was bewildered again. So I concluded, what was the conclusion of his? He said that I concluded the people who had the most knowledge of this, whether it's Rasul Sallallahu or Sahaba and Tabi'un, they were the people who were farthest away from this discussion. And who have the least knowledge of this are the people who involve excessively in the discussion of Qadr. And of course, the Day of Judgment is the end of the topic that inshallah when we have the discussion for the, the when we open the floor, we'll probably be able to touch upon that. Barakallahu feekum, jazakumullahu khairan. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين اللهم صل على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم. Um, there's not too much to add what our great scholars have said on the subject covering the main pillars of Islam, the pillars of belief. Um, there was another angle that I wanted to come at and look at the big picture on the subject, which is in Surah Al-Baqarah, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala describes the believers, and Allah Subhanahu wa Taala states that the believers they believe in Allah. They believe in the prophets. They believe in um, uh, they believe in Allah, the prophets, and the angels, and so forth. And then Allah Subhanahu wa Taala says about them, "Waqalu sami'na wa atana," that the believers have said that that we have heard and we have obeyed. And so the default should be that any time something is told to us that this is what Islam believes, the default is we believe in it, even if we can't find a rational answer for it whether it be on the topic of uh, divine decree on Qadr and so forth. Everything, the, the, the first option is to believe in it. For those of us who have more of a philosophical bent, more of a rational bent, the more you look into these subjects, you'll find that there is evidence for all of these within, within scripture, within comparative theology, within history, within archeology. span And that's to me one of the real miracles about Islam as we were discussing on Wednesday is Islam is a miracle at every single level, at the theological level. The concept of God in Islam is a concept of, uh, is a teaching of God that every single prophet had taught, that it's not new. Whether it be looking at the indigenous peoples of Canada and looking at their belief system, looking at the original teachings of the Torah or the original teachings of Jesus, peace be upon him, you'll find that they're all teaching the same exact message. So Islam is not an Arabian religion. Islam is not an Indian religion. 
Islam is not an African religion. Islam is the universal religion. The creed of Islam has always been taught from the beginning of Prophet Adam alayhi salam until the final Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam. And moving on to what we've discussed about uh, prophetology, um, again, the teachings of Islam just, they make too much sense, if I'm being honest with you. It just makes complete sense. You know, the fact that prophets were sent to every single land, every prophet taught the same exact message, the same exact creed, every prophet taught that there's going to be a day of judgment, that you are going to be revived. Every single prophet taught this, and what Islam is saying is that the final prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam is the universal prophet. And I like to think of it, you know, if you want to use an analogy, looking at uh, storylines. And you can look at it at the beginning of humanity. The beginning of humanity begins with Adam alayhi salam, with the prophet Adam. And every prophet, when they're about to die, when they're about to pass away, they're telling their followers that there is going to be that prophet who is going to come. These are the signs of him and inform your followers of him as well. And so it's almost like there is a buildup. You know, stories and movies, they always have this buildup leading to the peak. And it's almost as if the peak of humanity is when the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam comes. And the moment that he arrives, it's a real miracle because you had many Jewish rabbis who were awaiting him. And the question we have to ask is why were the Jewish rabbis in Medina? Right? Jerusalem is the capital. And then why is it that all of the rabbis that were in Medina, why is it that all of the Jews that were in Medina were the rabbinical class? What was it that they were seeing in the Torah, in the Old Testament, that led them to conclude that the final prophet of humanity would come in Medina? And when the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam first arrives in the city of Medina, there is a Jewish rabbi named Ka'b al-Ahbar radiallahu an, who was the lead scholar of the Torah in Medina. And he said, I was reading through the Torah often looking for the final prophet. And he said, when I heard news that the final prophet had arrived in Mecca, I always wanted to see him. I always wanted to visit him, to see if he was really true, sallallahu alayhi wasallam. And so when the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam arrives in Medina, everybody gets together and they want to hear what is the first thing that he's going to talk about. And so Ka'b al-Ahbar goes and he looks at him. And he said, the moment that I saw him, I knew that he wasn't a liar. SubhanAllah. And when he spoke to him and he heard about the message of the first khutbah where the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam said to spread peace, to give food, uh, uh, salam, ta'am, that uh, give food to people uh, and pray within the night. He said, I knew that this was the final prophet. And the lead rabbi became Muslim. And one of the other geniuses of the Prophet Muhammad is that when he became Muslim, he called all of the rabbis with him. And this is a tactic he always did. And so the lead rabbis came. And he said to them, what do you think of Ka'b uh, al-Ahbar? And they said, he's a learned man. Nobody knows the Torah better than him. And, and the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is reported to have said, what if I told you he became Muslim and he was one of my followers? And they denied it entirely. And then he walks in and he says that I'm a follower of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So everything in Islam, I promise you, the more and more you look into the subjects, everything makes sense. It is the religion that the human being was born on. It's the original disposition that the human being was born in. The human being was born knowing that there is a higher power, that there is a God. And everything at every level of Islam is very intuitive. You know, for those who attended the Wednesday lecture, we looked at the theological miracle of Islam, the miracle of the Quran, which I think is worth mentioning again, that how is it that you have an entire scripture memorized word for word? I guarantee you right now, I could read a passage of the Quran 
and make a mistake and probably a dozen people could correct me. At least a dozen people. How is it that you have probably a hundred million people who have memorized a book from front to cover, who don't even know Arabic entirely? How do you have all these children in Gaza right now who are, memori who are memorizing the entire Quran in two months? In two months they memorized the whole scripture. How, how is it? There's no scripture that I know of. The Old Testament, the New Testament, the Hindu, the Hindu scriptures, the Sikh scriptures. Nobody has memorized it. So Islam really, as our dear teachers have been saying, is a miracle at every level. And to me, the one miracle that cannot be denied, as the great uh, poet of the subcontinent, Allama Iqbal said, he said that you can, sure, you can deny God's existence. Because, you know, you claim that you're not able to see God, and you claim that it's really a theoretical discussion. He said, it's fine. But how can you deny Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, a human being who lived amongst you, who was from you? He was a human being. He was the most influential person in humanity, according to Michael Hart. And the, 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 one of the miracles of the religion of Islam is it's not a religion of theory. It's not a religion for just philosophers to think about. It's a religion of action. It's a religion of transformation. In human history, nobody ever once cared about the Arabs in the peninsula. Alexander the Great got to the Arabian Peninsula and he said there's nothing here and he went, he went elsewhere. There were people from the beginning of history that nobody really cared about. But yet within, within 20 to 30 years, the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam focused on teaching his companions to the point that within 30 years they conquered the Persian Empire and the Persian Empire never came back. That within a couple hundred years, the Roman Empire, uh, the entire Roman Empire was conquered. It never came back again. How is it that in 50 years, Islam went all the way from Spain to China? From Spain to China within, I think, close to 50, 60 years after his death, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. How do you have all these remarkable people? Do you know who the most influential woman in history is? Who is the most influential woman in history, if you think about it? Aisha radiallahu anha is the most influential, the wife of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa is the most influential woman in history. She was a judge. She narrated so much of the teachings of Islam. She led out uh, an army out uh, in an expedition and she preserved the teachings of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa who is the most influential person in humanity. And so Islam gave birth to a couple who, that became the most influential man and the most influential woman in history. The Khalid bin Walid becomes one of the greatest generals in history who've never lost. And how then did Islam, if it was just a theory, how then did it produce the greatest civilization that ever existed? The civilization that produced mathematics, that produced astronomy, 49 of the uh, 53 uh, uh, astronomical stars still have their Muslim names. And if you read 1001 Inventions by National Geographic, they said that the Muslim contribution to astronomy was solely because of Islam. Because Islam, uh, as we mentioned on Wednesday, calls one to be one with nature. And so our salah times are in accordance with nature. We use water uh, for our purification. Our months are determined not by a calendar, but by the sightings of the moon and so forth. So hospitals, universities, the chairs in universities was created by the Muslims. Because when Muslims sat with their teachers, the students sat on the floor and the teacher sat on the chair. And when it, it went, uh, the education system went through Spain, we got the idea of the chair of the physics department. The gowns that we wear for graduation, does anybody know the history of the gowns? The, the, when, when, the, when, the, uh, when, the, when the Christians came to Andalusia, to Muslim Spain, they, uh, they started imitating the Muslims, and the Muslims in Spain would keep the Qur'an on their head to always remind themselves that the Qur'an was always greater than them. And so what we wear at graduation is a thobe with a hat which used to be a Qur'an, and the, the, the string that comes off to the side the Muslims actually put it there because it was always a reminder that at any moment in your life, God can pull you out of existence. And yet that comes into the West. 
The first universities were created by the Muslims. So Islam is not a religion about theory. It's a religion about transformation, about action. And the history of the world has shown that the Muslim civilization, and this is a proof that Islam is a universal religion because Islam begins with the Arabs. And then within 30, 40 years, it goes into what we call Sham, the Syria, Lebanon area. And then the head of the Muslims were the Persians with the Abbasids. So the Persians, who the Muslims fought 30 years ago, became the leaders of Islam. And then, uh, and then 100 years uh, uh, after, you have the, the Muslims in Spain and Morocco who are now the leaders of Islam. And then for 600 years, you have the Turkish people who are the leaders of Islam. And it's always moving because Islam is the universal religion. And for that reason, it's, it, it is a miracle. And I, I really, I, I tried coming at this religion from many different angles, trying to disprove it. And I, I still cannot find a, even a good argument because at every single dimension, it's a proof. At the level of the Quran, at the level of hadiths, we have over probably 100,000 statements attributed back to the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, all with an isnad, with a trace. How? How is this religion preserved? And the last thing that I will mention, which is something uh, interesting I came up with, is that if you look at the Quran, the Quran, the time the Quran is revealed, there are two global religions at the time and two global world powers. You have the Romans and you have the Persians. And when Surah al rum the, the chapter of the Romans is revealed, the Roman Empire is dealt a devastating blow that many historians said is going to disappear entirely. Right? What I'm about to mention is, is not my argument. My argument will come after. Um, uh, and so the idea was that the Persian Empire was going to dominate the world. And yet the Quran said that the Romans will bounce back and defeat them which was a miracle that historians like Juan Cole have said. But here is another miracle, is if you look at the Quran, the Quran and the Hadith are not interested in Persia at all. You will not find a single verse in the Quran that talks about the theology of the Persians, nor the Hadiths, because the Quran is focused on Christianity and Judaism. Why? Why didn't it focus on Persia? Because the author of the Quran knew that the Persian religion would disappear and would be irrelevant. And so the Quran is focused on the two religions that dominated the world aside from Islam, which is Judaism and Christianity. And another miracle is that the Quran focuses on Judaism and the history of the Jewish people has shown that it is an absolute miracle that the Bani Israel, that the Jews have survived. How many times have they been persecuted from the Babylonians, from the Romans, from World War II? But the Quran knew that they would still be around. All of the other small religions like the Ebionites all disappeared. So the author of the Quran had this foresight that they, the author knew that these are going to be the main religions and that these religions will be there. So uh, we did the lecture on Wednesday, which goes more in depth into many of these subjects. But I just wanted people to know that at every single level of the religion, whether it be at a psychological, sociological, historical, archaeological, theological, uh, I don't know any other words, but any of these dimensions, Islam is an absolute miracle. And in the Q&A, we can open it up and go more in depth into any of these subjects. So inshallah, we await your questions. Jazakumullah khairan. Takbir. That was not loud enough. Takbir! MashaAllah. Okay, um, just a quick highlight. Uh, like dear uh, brother Ahmed mentioned, the lecture on Wednesday, it is available, inshallah, it will be available soon actually on our YouTube, which is SFU Muslim Student Association. So if anyone is interested, uh, make sure to check it out on our YouTube channel. Inshallah, it will be posted there soon. Now we're gonna go to the Q&A section. So there is a menti code right here at the back. It's 6453272. So inshallah, we're gonna take questions from the audience, but also you feel free to fill it out on menti.com. And uh, with that, inshallah, we'll get started. So we will have a microphone that will be passed around, inshallah. And all good? All good. Okay, so let's get started. Anyone from the crowd, inshallah.
questions yeah. here. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. <clears throat> so scholars have written that there are many ways to do tazkiyah, purification, and reach that spiritual level. Um, connecting to a sheikh, uh, a sheikh that you trust, a sheikh that you are close to, uh, connecting with that sheikh really, really help with tazkiyah. Scholars have written that staying away from sins, that is the greatest form of tazkiyah, especially uh, in today's age where we have cell phones and you know, so much haram can happen through cell phones. Um, I was reading in a book the other day from one of our mashaykh. He says, he writes in that book that 60 years of ibadah will give you a certain nur from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the only thing it will take for Allah to snatch that nur away from you is one evil glance. Looking at one haram you know, willingly will take away the nur of 60 years of ibadah. So protecting yourself from these sins. There are certain things you don't even consider as sins, right? Like listening to music. You know, Sheikh, there's a, there's a difference of opinion. You know, like things like that. Or, you know, looking at haram. You know, things like that. Especially you guys in university setting. You need to make sure that you protect yourself um, you know, from these evil glances. You need to make sure that you protect yourself, you know, from interacting with the opposite gender with the wrong intention. And if you guys are doing a project together, the Sheikh can agree with this, there's no need to chat about it on Snapchat, you know, like you can have a very professional conversation, right? So, so things like that, these little things that we don't even consider, you know, it's wrong, that really ruins our spirituality. So aside from being with a Sheikh, uh, protecting yourself or trying the best to stay away from sins, especially lowering your gaze, that will take you to another level of spirituality, inshallah. So we have a, do we have another question in the audience before we get to the, um, the online ones. Does anybody have a question? Okay, we'll go to the online ones then. So the question is, in this day and age, universities promote liberalism and challenge, uh, liberalism which challenges the faith. How can students identify themselves as a believer in Allah and challenge uh, liberalism? Subhanallah. <laughs> the issue with respect to liberalism and secularism, as I have stated very briefly, that there are two different paradigms, secular versus spiritual, two different foundations. But what we need to look at over here, you know, before you get to the level of university, the way you are raised, the very values that you are nurtured upon will make a big difference. MashaAllah, in your midst, you will see some of the, mashallah, very youth, some of the youngsters and youth, they are very devote, devoted to their faith, devout practicing Muslims. And that, because not necessarily about the liberal values that they are being, subhanAllah, they, that they are studying or in the secular setting that, setting that they are in, what is important to note that the environment that they have made themselves 
part of, plays a big role in the perception and the development of the personality. The second important thing that I can suggest, all of these ideas of liberal, liberalism and secularism, they, it, they are, at many levels there are different fallacies, but because religions have been around throughout human history. This in itself is a proof, and the, your very nature, primordial nature, will, because there was a recent study done, I think some of the Western universities, uh, 2022 or 2023, why is it so easy for children to recognize the supreme being and also to synchronize very easily with the creator? Because the, the very DNA of human being requires that they, they recognize the, uh, the authority and the existence of the, the, the supreme being. So this is why looking at these things will be very helpful. And last but not least, of course, when you are studying all of these ideologies, all of these different types of ism, you also need to you know, take a step back and try to understand the very foundation of the argument. Where is it coming from? And you don't have to buy into and accept each and everything that other, because you know, we as a rational being, as an intellectual individ individuals, we don't accept each and everything that is being presented to us. So why do you want to accept all what is being promoted around you? You can challenge that. In order for you to be able to challenge, as mashallah, brother Ahmed Khan, Hafiz Ahmed Khan said, you know, he tried from many different angles to disprove, disapprove Islam. So I will even take one step forward, all religions in general, right? not necessarily about Islam. The very concept of religion itself is something that your nature, your existence, and your mind itself will accept and will also accommodate. So these are the things that we can look at, inshallah. With that, hopefully some other panelists will be able to add more to it. Um, Truth cannot change. The, the project of modernity and postmodernity has shown that in every new era, there is a new philosophy, there is a new set of morals, there is a new set of morality. And what liberalism has showed is that there is, um, I mean, what we're witnessing right now with Palestine, we're seeing that liberalism is collapsing before us. These ideas, which may sound nice in theory, always have exceptions. And so the, the project of liberalism, um, to a certain extent, has failed. And the religion of God, as Mufti Shujat has mentioned, the, the religion of God has always been here and will always be here. These ideologies, one day they're here, one day they're gone. And so one of, the, you know, one of the tests you can use to figure out, especially those people who are in philosophy, about whether or not an idea is good, is to see how it's implemented in the world and to see how it impacts one's life. And many studies have done from a psychological, sociological angle, how Islam, the, the teachings of Islam, which many of the other religions to this day still share, brings about the best society. And that's why largely, to a certain extent, the Muslim, uh, Muslim families are the, uh, are the healthiest families. Muslim societies have some of the lowest uh, crime rates. Um, and so liberalism, even the greatest philosophers on liberalism are beginning to recognize that it's beginning to collapse. And uh, Islam is a religion that will has always been here and will always be here until the end. And so don't fall for the, geist, the, the zeitgeist of giving away religion in order to take liberalism. And this is another miracle about Islam that I will mention, is that Islam is a complete way of life from beginning until end. And so when one adopts Islam, all the way from one's ritual practices, to one's family relations, to one's uh, economic uh, situation, Islam discusses it all. And what happens to people, and I've met students at SFU here who have told me this, is when they have discarded religion, they have solved one issue, but they have brought about so many other issues. And the issue being, is now that they've discarded Islam, they need to figure out what is their economic uh, philosophy, what is their moral philosophy, what is their spiritual philosophy. And they will go and they will take Buddhism as their spirituality, communism as their economic philosophy, uh, stoicism as their way of life. 
And one SFU uh, uh, student uh, told me that when he did this, his, he felt he was all over the place and everything was contradictory and he was never satisfied. But when you adopt Islam, what you're adopting is a full way of life from beginning until end. And anybody who has uh, practiced Islam and anybody who has tasted Islam has realized that this has to be the truth. And it's the most intuitive way. And that's why we're seeing really in the society, we are seeing mass conversions to Islam, particularly in light of Palestine. If anybody spends, I wouldn't necessarily recommend this, but goes on TikTok and searches up the word revert, just search up the word revert, you will find hundreds of videos of people coming into Islam saying that the faith of the Palestinian mothers and the Palestinian fathers has shown them that this religion is not just a religion of theory, that it has, it has, it has entered every single part of their body and it's something that you know, a father can hold up his dead daughter and have this contentment knowing that he will be reunited with her in the next life. No ideology has the power to bring that. No ideology can overcome the fear of death. It cannot. It is only the religion of God, the religion of Islam, which can really transform an individual. So intellectually, we can make the argument that Islam is the greatest of all. Um, Islam is not an ideology, but a greatest of ideas. But also, but also we can argue that it brings about the best way of life possible. I guess that's a question directed to me. Um, the, uh, can you repeat the last part of the question about scientists? Most scientists are known to be atheists and some of their work was destroyed. Why is that not considered? Um, so this, the scientists work was destroyed? Yeah, most. Basically most atheists, the scientists, okay. uh, their work was destroyed. So why were they not considered? Uh, I don't fully understand the question, but um, an easy response is that Islam begins at, um, you can, we can say it begins in the seventh century. And in the argument is, is that if the, if the Nobel Prize was, 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 was started to be given in the seventh century, it would go to the Muslims. And the Muslims, all contrary to public per, uh, perception, they talk about this idea of the golden age of Islam during the Abbasids when the Muslims were translating all of these books, making these remarkable discoveries. But the truth of the matter is that the Muslims were still making all of these remarkable inventions until the ending of the Ottoman Empire. And so the Muslim civilization produced, you know, it's hard to point at something and look at history and find no precedent of any Muslim who didn't develop it. Um, and even today, um, there are some Nobel Prizes, there are several no Nobel Prizes that, uh, that, um, that Muslims have won. But the problem with science, uh, science today um, is not with science, but with scientism. Is when you turn science into uh, an ideology that it's the only way of knowing the world. And very quickly, it's an ideology that can be refuted at many different levels. But the easiest level is the idea of consciousness. This is what's known in philosophy as the hard problem of consciousness. Where is consciousness? It's a question in light of AI. I've met some of the biggest uh, thinkers in AI and they've said we are still struggling with this question because where is consciousness? It's something that's immaterial. It's something that, that, that transcends the physical world. Um, the existence of God can be proven at a rational level and the existence of God uh, proves that there is more to this world than materialism. So science is only one metric of success. If somebody wants to make the argument that this is the greatest civilization, well, the argument would be from a material economic uh, standpoint. But anybody who has spent enough time here knows that the suicide rate is insane, nihilism is insane. And I'll give a story. I was in my history class um, in the AQ uh, many years ago. And uh, my professor had uh, passed around uh, pieces of paper to everybody. And she said, 
this is the first day of class. Can everybody tell me a little bit about themselves? You know, we are one of the top universities in Canada. Um, it seems like everybody's very driven. What is uh, something important about you that you want me to know? And I was looking at my classmates and, you know, they all relatively look like me um, in that, you know, they were all young. They weren't all, they weren't all Pakistani, but uh, they were from all walks of life. And the papers were handed back to the teacher. And she came back the next day, uh, the next week for class. And in the middle of, uh, it, she stood in the middle of the classroom. And this is a big lecture hall in the AQ. And she said, it disturbs me so much that all of my students are nihilists. All of my students are people who have lost complete meaning in their life, that there's nothing going on. And later on, I realized that that was an epidemic within this society, particularly amongst university students. So when we talk about success, what is the metric that we're using for success? Because even today, you know, it's undeniable that Western civilization is at the head of many of these sciences, but these sciences and these inventions have really brought about to a certain extent, the destruction of the world, the destruction of the environment, um, the destruction of the economy in so many different facets. So undeniably, the Western civilization has produced uh, an immense contribution to society, but at the same time, what the Muslims develop, and this is what they argue in National Geographic, and uh, George Muktasi and many people argue, is that the sciences that the Muslims uh, built were everything. And they laid the foundation for all of these other advances and so forth. So both are great civilizations, but I would still contend that the Muslim civilization, which lasted 1,200 years, the Western, Western project is only 500, 600 years old. The Muslim civilization lasted for 1,200 years. And the great Islamic historian, who was not a Muslim, um, uh, um, his name slips my mind, but he said, in the 16th century, if an alien came to the world, in the 16th century, if an alien came to the world, the alien would have concluded that the entire world was going to become Muslim. Because at that time, the four greatest empires, most powerful empires in the world were all Muslim. The Ottoman, the Mughal, the Safavid, the Central Asian. And they were at the head of producing all of these different inventions. So Islam has proven uh, to be something that lasts the uh, 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 last since the beginning until end and has given the imperative on almost every page of the Quran God says do you not use your intellect it's a very rational religion it's a religion that God pro proposes arguments to the reader and God uh, asks those questions in a rhetorical manner because the only answer could be that God is right and our great scholars can build upon that um, if people have questions so um, that's what I would argue, and the, um, uh, contrary to what many people believe, um, there are many incredible uh, scientists, physicists that are Catholic, that are Protestant, which I have, which, which I have met. So it's not just atheists that are, that, that are making these, uh, that are producing these inventions. Allah Again, just going back to the audience, making sure anyone? All right, back to online. What makes Islam unique, or what differentiates Islam from other Ahlul Kitab religions, and why is Islam always in the news showcasing the bad apples? So, can you repeat the question? Why Islam? So, basically, why is Islam unique? And why does media show it in a bad way, or ask the question, is it news showcasing Islam as the bad apples? Sallallahu alayhi wa sayyidina Muhammad wa alayhi wa sahbihi wa sallam taslima. With respect to the first part of the question, I mean, as Muslims, no doubt we believe in the uniqueness of Islam, but how do we prove that? I think uh, Hafiz Ahmed Khan, uh, I think a moment ago, alluded to you need to do some comparative religious studies to be able to make this point. And unfortunately, people don't do that, and therefore they are not able to make, come up with this type of distinction because of which Islam stands out as a very unique. And looking back at the history, you know, at the advent of Islam in the midst of many religions, 
This in itself is a historic proof. Why did Islam gain such a momentum in the world to be able to spread such far and wide in a short, in such a short period of time that, that there was no other religion in the world that did, did so? Why so? This in itself is a sign because not, we live in a secular world now. Therefore, we are divorced from this reality. It's, you have to do some comparison. Second thing, what makes Islam very unique is that the very complete code of life that it offers. It has solution to each and every problem of human society, the world at large, not just one. And subhanAllah, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala declares in the Quran, الْيَوْمَ أَكْمَلْتُ لَكُمْ دِينَكُمْ وَأَتْمَمْتُ عَلَيْكُمْ نِعْمَتِي وَرَضِيتُ لَكُمْ الْإِسْلَامَ دِينَ the, This word, Mufassirun, the, the you know, exegesis of the Quran, commenting on this, for example, Allah ibn Ashur, rahimahullah, and others, they say, Allah, God the Almighty, chooses you know, very precisely words to describe the very nature of the religion. That akmal, ikmal is like reaching to the perfection of the religion. Perfection to the religion. So God, a journey of the religion began with Adam alayhi salatu wasalam, the first human on, on the face of the earth. But it, the journey which was, that started long, long ago, it came to completion during the time of Rasulullah sallallahu Therefore, the previous divine scriptures and religions, although they were all divine, they were at, in many ways at a primitive stage. But Islam brought solution because it had to stay in the world till the end of time. You know, imagine how complex the world is, it is, is today, from political, economic, and the rest. But Islam has solution to all of that. So this is also another point. And now, the last point, uh, the, the part of the question, why Islam being portrayed as a bad apple? This is a problem with the media. You know, media is very biased. This is why uh, we as Muslims, especially living in the West, we need to own our own channels, radio channels and TV channels to showcase the beauty of Islam. If you and I don't do the world, unfortunately, is very biased in this regard. And they have reasons. This is why, you know, subhanAllah, uh, I will just end with this very powerful remark by um, Muhammad Asad, the, the convert. You know, in his, in his uh, autobiography, he made this point because he was traveling across so he came across people, obviously, who would object to religion. Only Islam, he said. Not necessarily Christianity, not necessarily Judaism, not necessarily Hinduism. So he reflected on this, and then he made this, you know, this conclusion. The reason, whenever the religion is talked about, why only Islam is being shown and showcased as a bad apple? Why? He said, because it is only this religion that has the, cha that has the power that has such a spirit to change the world. It is still alive today. It is because of this they are afraid of that. Another question is, what is the secret to acquiring Allah's love? What is the secret to attaining Allah's love? Okay, since I'm holding the microphone, <laughs> Bismillah. The key to loving Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or to gain Allah's love is to follow the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. قُلْ إِن كُنْتُمْ تُحِبُّونَ اللَّهِ فَاتَّبِعُونِي يُحْبِبُكُمْ Allah. Say if you love me, and this verse was primarily, yeah, I think Ibn Kathir mentions this, primarily related to the Christians, that it's about love. God is about love. We're always talking about love. There's no greater story of love than that of Islam. Allah loved Adam, hence he completely forgave him. There's no concept of original sin. Allah loved Adam, and he created him as a viceroy, put him on earth. Allah loved his children, so he sent prophets. He didn't have to send prophets. But Allah guided humanity through the chosen one, and made the chosen one the final messenger, and made him a proof through what he brought, the Quran. The Quran being the most unique miracle in the face of the planet from every angle. That's the uniqueness of our deen. We have a Nabi, we have a Prophet, and we have a book. And we say, قُلْ هَاتُ بُرْحَانَكُمْ إِنْ كُنْتُمْ صَادِقِينَ Go bring your proof, let's compare, let's see. So to get the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to love Him is through the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam by following Him. And following Him is not one or two things. Following Him has a big, big uh, inclusive term. To be like the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam is to first acknowledge your slavehood before Allah. 
This is something we're proud of. We say we are fuqara ila Allah. We are the needy servants of Allah. We're not needy to your Black Fridays. We're not needy to your consumerism. We're not needy to all the fitness and trials you throw at us. Because guess what? God has promised us a lot better than that. We just got to wait. So we're not servants to that. We're servants of Allah. By being servants of Allah, we're not servants to our desires and passions. Therefore, we don't suffer in our lust and our wants. Therefore, when we deny the self, which is really the whole teaching of Buddhism, you suffer to the extent of how much you desire. When our desire becomes one, none of you believe until your hawa, your desire, lines up with what I have brought. So when your desire and your love and your truthfulness lines up with that of the Prophet Muhammad you're already on the path of God. And I'll relate a beautiful story just on this topic. Because these are questions you always ask. I was with my Shaykh Rahimullah, one of probably the most knowledgeable Shaykh I ever met. I looked at him, I said, Shaykh, he goes, Naam. I go, how do you know if Allah loves you? <clears throat> and the answer he gave is the most beautiful question, answer I've heard. He said, if you can say, La ilaha illallah, Allah loves you. Because Allah wouldn't have allowed anybody to utter that except the one whom he loves. And if you pray five times a day and you fast in Ramadan, that means you're closer to his love. And if you are more and more and more in line with the Prophet ﷺ, to the extent of how close you are to following him, inwardly and outwardly, inwardly and outwardly, outward is important, inward is important. And how he looked, how he talked, how he dressed, how he walked, how he embodied, how he cared, how he loved, how he was courageous, how he was compassionate, how he was merciful, how he was with his neighbors, how he was with his enemies, how he honored and respected and gave that right to dignitaries, and how he treated people that were lost. Like the beautiful story Sheikh Usama gave the Prophet Sallallahu putting his hand on the heart of that person making dua for him. If we're in the company of the Prophet Sallallahu for 10 seconds or 5 seconds, he looked at us. We don't need to look at him, actually. Abdullah ibn Umm Maktoum never saw the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi The Prophet saw him. We have the concept of evil eye. There's also a concept of good eye. And that is if the Messenger of Allah just gazed upon you once and moved his gaze over, that's it. Congratulations, we're going to go party because you just became the greatest of all people that ever walked the planet after the prophets. Simple as that. So when we know that God has already given most of us all of this, then what should be our gratitude? Do we doubt him? Do we doubt? The only reason we fall for any ism out there is because we're not firmly established in our religion. And we're not firmly established in our religion sitting at home saying, I'm a Muslim, I'm a Muslim. You can say that all you want. You have to take the path. قُلْ هَذِهِ سَبِيلِي أَدْعُوا عَلَى اللَّهِ عَلَى بَصِيرًا This is my path I call to Allah. As one of my Arab Syrian shaykhs, Hafidullah, always says, عَلَى بَصِيرًا With insight, with knowledge, with purpose, with a state, with a hal, I call to Allah. أَنَا وَمَنَ اتَّبَعْنِي أَنَا وَمَنِ اتَّبَعْنِي Me and all those who follow me. So in order to have that, my advice to myself and all of you is we rely upon Allah to achieve this, but to follow the path means the following. As Shaykh Usama said, you have to be connected to a Shaykh. People flip out in this city. They're like, you don't have a doctor. I'm like, yeah, I don't have a doctor. We have to have a doctor. Okay, fine, I have to have a doctor. But where when we say, you don't have a Shaykh, you have to have a Shaykh, no one talks about that. No one talks about the need of a teacher. If not a spiritual guide, a teacher in the religion. Because what is the religion other than spiritual guidance? Even language is supposed to help you get to spiritual excellence. Everything is attached to our relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So in that regard, we have to follow the way. What do we mean in detail? You must learn knowledge. And once you learn knowledge, you have to apply that knowledge. How do you apply that knowledge? Obey Allah first by doing what is obligatory. Then, by the nawafil, by the optional, voluntary acts of worship. Without that, you don't actually get to wilaya kamila. You have to follow the nawafil too, not just the fara. 
But in our time now, people get attracted to the sunnas, to the nafila, and sometimes to the bid'ah. There is bid'ah nobody talks about. Qiyam in masjid tonight. What qiyam? Ish qiyam. Where is it narrated? Nothing is narrated. We're all going to go do qiyam. No one questions that. Yeah, and they question the four madahib when we tell them there's 20 rakats for taraweeh, no one has the bid'ah. You want to talk about bid'ah? Let's talk about bid'ah. That's bid'ah. But we see it as khayr. We see it as good. So seek knowledge, apply the knowledge, be in the company of somebody who affects you, who affects your heart. That could be a righteous brother. That could be a good shaykh. That could be somebody who doesn't have as knowledge as, as much knowledge as some shaykhs, but they have a knowledge that when you sit with them, they impact your heart. They really affect you by their spiritual state, by their humbleness, by their akhlaq, by their character. Sometimes people have a lot of knowledge, but they don't have character. They don't have character, ruins their akhlaq. One scholar of the Malikis was let go, no one studied with him, just because of a single comment that he made about another scholar. He said, what do you need his book for when you have mine? He was left in Islamic history. They went with another shaykh. Simple concept. That's why we're not like, I'm not a scholar, but most of us are not real scholars. Real scholars died a long time ago. <laughs> These are, we're fill-ins. That's the reality. Real shaykh, they were real shaykh. And real murids and real tullab. A murid today in the spiritual path is just majazi. It's not real murid. You kept in the company of 30 years in your shaykh, you watch how he ate, how he slept, how he prayed, how he behaved, you mimicked him until you became like him. Now it's long distance. Shaykh sends us a message this month, let's do this, mashallah. Okay, that's fine. But now when you're out partying Friday night, now when you're downtown, now when you can't control your nafs and it's all lost, the path is not gonna save you. That's just the name. al ism bidun al That's just the name without reality. So all of us are responsible for our own selves. The teachers that we took from emphasize strongly and knowledge and good company of the ulama. Good knowledge and good company of the ulama. If you don't have that, you won't get very far. You'll get to some levels, but you won't take from the extra sweetness and the energy and the food of nourishment that you'll need in longevity. That's why what the Prophet ﷺ said, one learned scholar is harder on shaitan than 1,000 abid, devout worshippers. Why? Because a faqih knows all the tricks of the devil. Does the real faqih? My shaykh used to tell me, the real faqih is the one who fears Allah. Faqih means the jurisprudent, the scholar, but it has more implication than that. The real one who knows is the one who fears Allah. And so whoever you find like that, that's a faqih. You keep in their company. And inshallah, if you don't have any company, one of the great scholars, he said a beautiful line. He said, if you don't have any company, keep the company of the Prophet ﷺ. Even to some extent where your own company is bad for you. How do you lose your own company? How, you, know, you know what I'm talking about. Sometimes you're sitting, you get bad thoughts. I hate myself. Why do I have this desire? Astaghfirullah, get away from me. You're sick of your own self. How do you get rid of your own self, your own company? By sending salawat upon the Prophet ﷺ. Because when you sit and send salawat on the Prophet in those moments, you're away from yourself. You're in the company of the Messenger of Allah. So he says, salatu was salam. Alayka ya Sayyidi, ya Habibi, ya Nura Aini, ya Sayyid al Awaleen, ya Rahmatil al Alameen. Say what you want of love in any language that you want. All of it will reach the Prophet. What's better than that? Allah has allowed us to connect directly to the Messenger. How many people can even say that? How many people can claim that? And yet Allah made that act of worship as the greatest of acts of worship that has so much uniqueness that no other. Action has been said that Allah and His angels send salawat upon the one who sends one salat upon the Prophet said, You show me where it says otherwise. SubhanAllah. So that's our key. The Prophet Sallallahu His path, His Sharia, His way, His Sirah, and those that embody and follow them. Wherever you find that beauty, take it, be with them, and you've already achieved success. Barakallahu feekum. Sorry to Lord.
that means that we are lacking in our job for Allah, one. And then how do we know that we love Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam or we love him enough? How can we increase our love for the Prophet Mashallah, beautiful question. Mashallah, shows the knowledge of the person asking this wonderful question. And those next to me with more knowledge can correct, so Allah yubarak fikum. Uh, committing sins or lacking in our worship doesn't mean that we don't have enough love of the Prophet or Allah. There was a man who used to um, commit some sins and when asked about it, the Prophet said, leave him for he loves Allah and his messenger. From that, the scholars deduce that if we disobey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala here and there, it doesn't mean we do not have love of Allah. But there is not a perfection of that love. Love has levels. And so in our love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and that's why I said to the extent of how much we follow the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, will to be to the extent or commensurate with how much love we have from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And, and if we're struggling, it doesn't mean, it does not negate the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It just means we need to work on that love. And, you know, love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is also a fear of Allah. Because if we love Allah a lot, what do we fear? Losing His love. And when you fear losing His love, you fear disobeying Him. That's why it says, وَمَنْ لَمْ يَتُوبْ فَأُولَٰئِكَ هُمُ الظَّالِمُونَ Whoever doesn't repent, they're the wrongdoers. And as Shaykh Osama mentioned, the ones, if you hide yourself in the house, lock yourself up not to go out because of sin, Allah will bring in people who will go out. This is exactly the point. That it's not the sin that will destroy you, it's what you do after. And the people of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they repent right away. They feel bad for it. Yes, there are sins that destroy our faith, that make our faith weak, but it's not enough to take us out of the religion. It's not enough to move us away from the love of Allah. Rather, you can use it as energy to do more and to also break yourself in your nafs. This is why when you commit a sin, you feel terrible. Imam Ibn Atayla, rahimahullah, in one of his hikam, he basically alludes to the fact that if someone out of sin and ma'asi led them to be in a humble state before Allah, of shame and brokenness before Allah, is a better state than a state of the one who's always obedient that has led them to arrogance. Both are bad. He's not saying, you know, that's a good state. He's saying that's a better state. Why? Because the one who has arrogance doesn't enter Jannah. And one of the great Syrian sheikhs, he said, every disease that's linked to the heart is a major sin in Islam. That's very serious. And then the second part of the question, which was what? Uh, how do we know that we love Prophet Muhammad so love so love enough? How can we increase our love? Now, in order to really know that, and what I've seen from some of our teachers, is to read the early works of the ulama, like Shifa of Imam Qadiriyal. This is one of the great works of the Shifa and the Shamail. Read the Shamail because in some of the works of the Shamail, there's a description of the Salaf al Salih, how much they love the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. They love the Messenger of Allah so much that some of them, if the Prophet was mentioned, they used to start weeping and crying. Even some couldn't speak for several days. Some of them loved the Prophet Sallallahu among the companions so much, they went to what we may even consider extreme levels. Like I think it was Abdullah bin Zayd when he heard the passing of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he made dua, oh Allah take my eyesight, I don't want to see anyone after the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Allah answered that. And some like Sayyidina Umar ibn al-Khattab, that he was so affected by the passing of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he took his sword, went in the street, said, if anyone says that the Prophet has passed away, I'll take their necks off. Nobody's going to challenge that. He was so upset. And it was Sayyidina Abu Bakr, who's normally the one who had a lot of tears and a lot of softness, he's the one that stood up and said those famous lines and read the ayah as if they had forgotten that ayah in Surah Ali Imran that Muhammad is but a messenger, many who pass before him. And then he, wherever he says the famous lines, whoever worshiped the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu then know that he has passed. And whoever worships Allah, he cannot die and will always live on. This year, one of my dear teachers that passed away, it's been really hard because, not just because I loved him or because I was close to him, is because no one else in the world I know can answer my questions like he was able to. So that lost and that feeling of hurt doesn't go away. It's, it's an empty place. 
At that time, I began to reflect on what can we possibly imagine how our mothers felt and how the companions felt when the Prophet ﷺ left this world. That's unspeakable of, especially to, to the level how much they loved him. They loved him more than any of us could love anything in this world put together. So that was devastation. And when we think about love of the Prophet ﷺ, we have to ask Allah for that love. And certainly you cannot love someone you don't know. So learn the Shema'il. Read Imam Tirmidhi's work on the Shema'il. Read Sirah. And read the stories of the righteous who loved him. Because that's how you know the love. There are many people, there was a beautiful munshid, Sidi Mu'ad, who passed away this year, the son of one of the great scholars of Sham, Sheikh Samir al Nas, rahimahullah. His name was Mu'ad, and I met him. I was a dream come true. He came to our city to sing Nasheed. And I was like, I wish I could meet this guy. And he was sitting drinking coffee. He looked over at me. He's like, Say, what do you want me to read tonight? And I was looking at him. I was like, this is like a dream. Hold on for a sec. Did I imagine even meeting you? You're here you're asking me what you should sing tonight? Let me just take that in for a moment. But every time I was around him, he passed away, rahimahullah. Many have seen him in the dreams with the Prophet Whenever I mentioned the Prophet I looked over at him, his eyes were red in tears. I was like, this is not a guy singing nasheed and that's it. This man is deeply in love with the Messenger of Allah. And the munshid is a murshid. Traditionally, the, the singer of the songs of the Prophet the sacred songs, was to guide your heart to him. And that's done with love. That when a person loves someone and they say a word about their beloved, it's different than an academic professor coming up here telling you about Allah compared to somebody who loves Allah and lives the life of Allah. And if they just say a word, I don't know about you guys, I'm not going to say which one of these brothers up here because I don't want to put them on the spot. But they, when they say words, I feel the power in that penetration because of their spiritual state. I don't know if you can do that. If you can't, you've been watching too many things you shouldn't be watching. But you got to be sensitive to that. Words are just words. But when they come from the vessel of the loved ones, of the pure ones, it goes into your heart. Now you have a pure vessel and you go pass it on. Otherwise, just junk. We're not out for junky stuff. Barakallahu feekum. I think this is worthy of everyone contributing a short line. I will say to this person, keep seeking. Keep seeking because Allah guides those who are sincere seekers. I've met many of my friends when I was back in high school and I had been blessed to really get into Islam. A lot of my friends converted to Islam and I never saw one really seeking sincerely except that they received guidance. So keep going and uh, look at the miracles of the Qur'an and look at the example of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Listen to what Brother Ahmed taught on Wednesday. That sounds really incredible. And then Allah will guide you, inshallah. We make dua, we make a call to Allah that He guide you, inshallah. Uh, for this individual, um, I would recommend uh, following the story of Sheikh Hashim Ahmed. Sheikh Hashim Ahmed was our guest speaker at Sri Jami Masjid last week, and he was in a very, very sim- similar situation as the person who asked this question. And one thing Sheikh Hashim Ahmed said, when he said that what really made me a Muslim was sujood. He said that when sajda is something else. And then he shared the story of, Sheikh was there with him, of this person who was addicted to heroin. And he saw a picture of Muslims doing sajda in New York, and he spent the entire night in sujood. In the morning, he didn't need any heroin anymore. So I would highly recommend making dua, as Sheikh said, make a lot of dua, make dua in sujood, in prostration. And yeah, we have Mufti Ahmad Khan's videos, uh, and uh, Sheikh Hashim Ahmad, uh, follow his story as well, inshallah. Uh, it will really help. Translate dua as supplication. Uh, du- uh, sorry, I forgot to translate. Dua is supplication is uh, talking to Allah, is asking Allah and begging Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to put your heart the right way, inshallah. So. Bismillah, <coughs> 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 <coughs>
In my humble opinion, what I would like to advise first and foremost, this quest of yours is commendable, remarkable. I truly honor that. Looking around the people that we find ourselves in the midst, many are lost. But you are in the quest of the truth. I salute to your, Mashal, since your quest, this is something to appreciate and acknowledge. The other two things that I would like to add to, apart from what my prestigious uh, Mashaikh have st stated and had added, we know for a fact our soul is in the search of the truth. And the way to find that is, of course, to primarily, constantly seeking guidance from God the Almighty. And that is what we call dua, basically, what was said. And I would possibly, if I may suggest, you know, we have this in our tradition, of course, supplication, you could make it any time, but there are certain times your supplication will have a higher chance of acceptance. Certain times. And we know, for example, the last portion of the night, it's a very blessed, powerful, serene time. And it is something that you, when you stand before God the Almighty, in your case, just praying to God, show me the way. In times like that, I'm very optimistic, inshallah, this will help you. And the third thing, you know, as a person of you know, reason and rationality and educational background, I would suggest that as you say that you find signals from both, I'm not here to demonize astaghfirullah any religion, but the, my point being, you be the judge by doing some comparative religious studies. You know, of course, Christianity has certain things. You know, of course, the, it, it overlaps with the teachings of Islam, especially the moral, spiritual component of it. But how much is it, up, is, is it going to be practical for you to be able to apply in your practical life? You know, in practical life, in your social, in your family, in your economic, in, and the rest. Unfortunately, it is completely empty. Sorry to say that. Whereas when you look at Islam, I would say it would be very easy for you to come to the conclusion because it is a very holistic and wholesome religion that guides you at each and every avenue of your life. And this is why in the Western world, which is supposedly a secular, uh, the, the Christian world, it is this religion that is becoming the dominant religion. And there are reasons for that, right? So inshallah, these three things hopefully will be helpful. Bismillah. The one thing that's beautiful about Islam is that you get both Jesus and Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. You get a two for one. Because with Christianity, um, you have to come up with a type of rational answer as to why Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, was not a prophet. Despite him possessing all of the same characteristics that David had, that Jesus had, and that Moses had. And, and uh, denying those similarities is denying a large part of the Torah because the Old Testament is always referring back to that final prophet. And when Moses, peace be upon him, is on his deathbed in the book of Deuteronomy and he's saying that God will send a prophet like me, that prophet that he's referring to could only have been the prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam who was so identical with him in every manner that Jesus was not. And I want to quote uh, a passage from the Gospel of John, the last Gospel in the, um, from the four Gospels, where the Israelites had came to the prophet Yahya, uh, John the Baptist. And the Israelites said to him, they said, are you Elijah? And he said, no. And they said, are you the Messiah? He said, no. And they said, are you, if you're not Elijah and you're not the Messiah, then are you that prophet? And he said, no. So the Israelites were looking for three people and Islam gets it perfect because Islam says that the Messiah is Jesus, Elijah is Yahya, and that final prophet is the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And a very fascinating thing is that in the New Testament it says, it says an nabi the Prophet. And if you open up any dictionary, you can try this right now, if you open up any dictionary, whether it's 
Oxford or Mer- Merriam Webster, and you search up the Prophet, mm. it will say the Prophet Muhammad. Mm. So with Islam, you get Jesus, you get Mary. In fact, I would argue that the Quran portrays Mary in a much more beautiful and respectful manner than the, than the New Testament because Islam says that there is more to Mary than simply being the mother of Jesus. And I, I would highly encourage uh, you to read uh, Surah Maryam, I believe the 19th chapter of the Quran, which discusses the journey and the difficulty that Mary went through and then the birth of Jesus and how the Quran has the one, there's one thing the Quran mentions about Jesus that the four gospels do not mention. The fact that when the Israelites accused his mother of adultery, of fornication, that her son spoke from the cradle and protected his mother's honor. It's only found in the Islamic narrative. There are other apocryphal gospels that mention it, but the New Testament does not have it. So many Christians who have become Muslims have said that their love for Jesus and their love for Mary has only increased, especially because they put Jesus in his proper proper place, uh, peace be upon him. Because the, the Jews said, the Jews disrespected Jesus. If you read what Jesus has mentioned in the Talmud, there's a book, Jesus and the Talmud, they say very horrific things about Jesus and of Mary, and they went extreme. But then Pauline Christianity also went extreme and turned Jesus, this remarkable human being, one of the greatest human beings that ever existed, who did all these miracles, they took him to be a god. And Islam came and Islam said, we are going to take the middle path. God says, don't go extreme in your religion. And the Quran says he was not what the Jews are saying, nor is he what the Christians are saying. He was this beautiful prophet of God who taught the same things that Moses taught. And so with Islam, you get everything. And that's why a good way to look at Judaism, Christianity, and Islam is that Judaism, is, Judaism has the Old Testament. And Christianity has the New Testament. And Islam has the final testament, the final book of humanity. And so I would, I would highly encourage this person, aside from everything that's said, to read the chapter of Mary in the Quran, chapter 19, and um, the, the, the beauty of that, uh, of that chapter is one I think you can only discover when reading for yourself. Jazakumullah khair. All right, Jazakumullah Khair. This was truly an eye opening discussion. MashaAllah, it was amazing. And SubhanAllah, like, if anyone has any further question, I know a lot of people, we had like 31, 32 questions, MashaAllah, and due to time, it's very um, kind of impossible to answer all of them. However, inshallah, some of my shaykh will still be available after. So you're more than welcome to come up front and ask them your questions. And um, to show as a token of our appreciation, and honestly, nothing could be of the value of the knowledge these mashayikh gave us right now. However, we humbly want to give to them a certain package or gift that we have made for them, inshallah. And with that, inshallah, we'll end the event for tonight. Jazakumullah khair for everyone coming out. And for those who are still interested and have questions, SFUMSA has a da'wah booth every Wednesday in the AQ. So you're more than welcome to pass by. And even if you, you don't have the time to, you can reach out to me, inshallah, or any of the mashayikh, and they'll be more than happy to answer your questions. Jazakumullah khair. Assalamu alaikum. I uh, wanted to take just a quick opportunity to actually thank Brother Abdul Aziz, Wajahat, and the MSA who work so hard, they do all these things. Somebody like me just show up, grab the mic. So we're nobody, astaghfirullah, barakallahu feekum. May Allah reward them and bless them and all the MSA. May Allah increase you guys, inshallah, keep doing the hard work. Barakallahu feekum, jazakallahu khair.
Um just a final answer, inshallah, we'll be praying Isha outside. So if anyone wants to pray Isha, um, we'll be starting a couple.